Hi, Claire. Hi, Barry. Um, so you're the last in our series, and that's because we held out to do it in person. We I mean, did, I'm very yes. glad we did. So this series has been about um, writers born in what we're calling the long 1970s, so, but who have shared that kind of um, cultural soup. We're all cooked yeah. in that cultural soup. So maybe just tell us about the world you grew up in, your childhood, 1980s Hoth, I suppose we're talking about. 80s or 70s? Because they were so different. Well, I'll start with the 70s. Well, the 70s was sunny and happy. Like, I remember it was um, a very different em economic environment and a very free. We were free range children, you know, we were just out. And then the 80s came and was miserable because of the economic depression. And I remember that not quite being the end of childhood, but um, a bleakness setting in quite early on in our lives that I think, well, I know it defined me. You know, um, I'm an architect's daughter, and from whenever the recession got really bad, we lived with this fear that he's going to lose his job, we're all going to have to emigrate. We were about to emigrate to Australia, and my dad broke his leg, and that didn't happen. But like it was, yeah, the 70s was great. The 80s was horrible. So you're about to emigrate to Australia and your father broke his leg and yes. that's why he didn't go? that's why I speak with this accent. Dublin. Yeah, it was, it was that harsh. Like my, my uncle, my mother's brother, was also an architect and he had to go to London every week and come home and his baby making strangers and that kind of thing. You know, the 80s was a tough old time and I would say as much as I'm defined by the 70s, 70s seems, and actually this only dropping now like I love the 70s I love 70s clothes I love 70s music I hate the 80s because it was just hard it was a bleak hard decade of fear and panic like do you remember the the news every night was like this factory closed in that place with the loss of this yeah, amount of jobs. jobs and there's no good news not here anyway so that's yeah what I remember is lots and lots of children and very little money or jobs lots so of children so lots of dogs Lots of dogs. Lots of dogs. Yeah. None of them had collars. Lots of dog poo. Um, and as I say, we did go out and play. We were, we just ran around all the time, and that was great. You know that aspect of it. And um, now, now I'm a mother, and I, I I cannot tally my childhood with his, or my experience of school with his. And I I, I don't know how it'll play out for him because it's so different. That I because. You know, we first of all there were loads of us in the class. Second of all, there was corporal punishment, Catholicism. Mind you, he has Catholicism, um, but probably not as old school as we had. So, all that stuff defines you in ways that you don't get, it, possibly ever. But you know, I find the Catholicism, though I'm not, I don't regard myself as a Catholic or believe in God. It's it's all over my work. It is, um, yeah. Whether I like it or not, it's there. So maybe say a bit more about what bits of the primary school world um, that we had, uh, that I mean you had in Hoth, that what that, that stuck with you um, through, through the rest of your life. So, mm -hmm. like say Catholicism in, in specifically, what kind of bits of it would you say? Um, confession. Do you remember confession? The box. Do you did you have to get into the box? Oh yeah, I yeah, had to get into the box. The box yeah. is gone yeah. for the kids. You know it's. Um, yeah. And it's called reconciliation now. So just that idea of someone else watching you, that was <laughs> so horrible. <laughs> like someone yeah. always watching you. And even as a child, it was, you'd sit on the toilet and go, <laughs> God's watching me. It's, to internalize that, you know, they the go on and on and on about Irish guilt. And there's a reason for that, because it is the, the, the watching person is inside you. It's instilled in you from, you know, from, well, Say I was the communion year, I was six, so five going in, six finishing it. So you had that, God is, is watching you. Yeah. You know. Do you feel there's a positive side to that too, that like somebody, at least somebody cares? Like they might be a very judgmental somebody, but it's important uh, what you do. Do you think that's helpful for a writer because it's such a self-starting, lonely profession? The idea, this kind of internalized idea that someone is watching? You know, just as you asked that, I don't think I ever felt God loves you even though we were told all the time God loves you and that you're special because God 
gave you a soul. So no, no. In fact, the writing came as part of rebellion against all of that. Just I don't want to be part of this anymore. And indeed, I've wondered if it wasn't, if I wasn't so kind of cauterized against it by, you know, you hit 14 and everything sort of explodes. And if I wasn't so angry, would I have had the drive to keep going against, you know, there are, there are a lot of reasons why you should not become a writer or go into the arts. There are far more reasons than not. But we don't have time today to go into all of those reasons. <laughs> 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 I have to pay someone to listen to that. But it's, if, if it had been easier, maybe I wouldn't have felt so yeah. angry. I think anger is actually a really good thing when you're that age to just, it clarifies what you want and, and what you're part of and what you're not part of, you know, and, and you find a different tribe. Like I remember getting really into Joyce at that age and he was very down on the church, you know, his work was a rebellion from it and the paralysis and, you know, and I found that exciting and I was like, yeah, what he says and I'm on this bus, not your bus. And, you know, it, that was, so no, it wasn't, a, it wasn't that I felt welcomed into God's love. It was like, I don't believe any of this and I don't believe that someone can see me all the time and I, 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 I am going a different route here. Well, just listening to these things you're saying now about your early childhood. So your father's an architect, there was unemployment and um, economic poverty around. Yes and um, Catholicism. So I suddenly, as you're talking, I can just see that running through all of your work. Money and especially debt is a theme that yes. takes there in Tenderwire. It's mm -hmm. there all the way through to the end. Buildings are, are very important. They're obviously in, um, in the Dove you know, but yeah. actually just generally buildings, I think, I'm just thinking, they seem to be very present. And then these kind of, this not quite satanic figures, well, in, in in the last novel, Satanic, but, yes. but a sense of um, a Jesus. fear of, of punishment and yeah. yeah, that they all seem to be running through. Yeah. And a lot of that actually, um, that I have an idea of the abyss <laughs> that, yeah. that people have an abyss. And I speak as someone who doesn't have a particular abyss, but I, I got glimpses of the abyss and actually not so much from Irish Catholicism, but from going to New York when I was 20 and ended up hanging out with all these recovering alcoholics who lived on the edge of that abyss. And if they took a drink, they were down in the abyss and it was hell. And I, used to, I spent that whole summer going to AA meetings in New York and listening to these stories. And coming from my background, which was um, safe, middle class, um, my dad didn't lose his job, so it worked out okay. Coming from that to people who were um, completely without anchors and partially in terror, that actually is where I got the whole demons, devil, um, this blackness that isn't that far away for some people and I, I tend to write about those people or did in my younger years you know I'm, on, I'm at a different era now in my writing life and the abyss isn't it, it's not actually, there's bits of the abyss but it's different now you know I think um, when you're young you're very volatile mm. and it's also very interesting you know it's um, you know when you're on a train platform and a train comes, I, this doesn't happen to me anymore, but it would happen a lot when, you're, when I was in my 20s and you just think, what if I jump? You know that? And it's not I didn't want to kill myself, but it was just like, what if? That would be a radical new way of, <laughs> and short way of looking at the world. You know, it, it's just that, that interest in, in, um, in looking at the chaos. But you haven't lots of in, throughout your work, it seems to me, just listening to you again there is, people who kind of go into an abyss and then come out or seem to come out. It's mm -hmm. not always clear to what extent the kind of exit from the abyss is real or an illusion. Is that right, would you say? Well, certainly the last guy didn't get out of the abyss. So no, he didn't. <laughs> I just, I just away. mean like there are these objects like the painting in All Summer, the violin and tender wire, and then in a way the kind of 
salvation figure of the famous writer in All Names Have Been Changed that yeah, people... Yeah, that know. is more about art. Art is the salvation, because that was my salvation. On a very literal level, that was my salvation. So certainly those three, my first three novels are the arts. As you said, one was a painting, the second one was music, and the third one was writing, and that's because it was my redemption. Um, you know, I used to have that, the leaving cert dream. That's probably <laughs> defines us. And older generations, I don't know if the younger kids have it as much, but the fear of the leaving Do you remember the leaving cert? And the <gasps> I do. Sorry, yeah, I God, I'd ever forget. Yeah. You know, it, the leaving cert was horrible, but I used to have that dream, oh, Christ, it's the leaving cert. And then one day, I, was, I had to do the leaving cert, and I didn't know anything because it was so long ago. And then I went, I wrote a novel. And I went, OK, you can go. And it was just this joy that I've, I've gotten out of that system uh, yeah. that I hated so much. So, yeah, it's that. Thinking that about growing up, yeah. It is art with salvation for me. It was yeah. my get out of jail card. So let's go back just then to Hope specifically, because sure. so it's always there. Um, yes. But in the in all in um, the devil, you know, it really becomes yes. central. And you quote the opening of Finnegan's Way, quote yeah. Castle and Environs. And the main character yes. is this old um, noble family from mm -hmm. Hope Castle. And, mm -hmm. and so it's a big part of it. Well, you're, you're a very international writer and your influence is much to read and drawn. But Hote specifically is, is very... Yeah. So maybe just tell me about the Hote you grew up in and yes. where that is in your imagination. It, it's so strange because the older I get, it's becoming bigger. Um, the Hote I grew up in was idyllic. Hote is beautiful. I mean, Hoth is, is this beautiful peninsula. Um, I now live in Hoth. I, I moved out, I moved around, and we got ourselves back to Hoth. And I just found out that the Irish for the area that I live in, Deer Park, is Park na Fianna, because the Fianna used to train in, I'd heard that before, and remember I mentioned to you, you came yeah. out to Hoth, and I said, somewhere there's ancient oaks here. Still can't find them, but the, the Fianna used to, and I just feel this history there. You know, I, I do genuinely feel this history there. So the house I grew up in, um, as I mentioned, was always sunny <laughs> in my head. It was always sunny. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the gorse was always in blossom. Gorse will always be in blossom in Hoth summer, but in April, May, it's like boing, you know, green, or sorry, yellow everywhere, and the smell, that coconutty smell, yeah. and the cracking then later in the year when the seed pods burst. Uh, there were a lot of ponies. Cherry O'Brien had his pony club going and as a kid I discovered the ponies, kids used to just hang out with ponies, little girls sorry, very much was a gender thing and we'd go up and groom these ponies and um, then when we were old enough we got to gallop around on the ponies and we had this freedom of this, this magnificent peninsula and um, I feel very protective of it and I, at the moment it's under siege again because they're back to developers but they, they bought Hoth Castle after 900 years they sold it to a capital company the family who had it since 1100 whatever. It is basically predicted in your novel I mean that's more I mean there's a yeah you know, well I the worst happened in the novel, and I didn't think it would happen because it, it never occurred to me that the family would sell, and they sold it to a capital company, and it's being carved up, and you know, um, and I feel this anxiety that you know they want to build on it. Obviously, it's a, it's an old castle domain with walls, and um, so I, now I, I fear for this place I love for the future because. You know, say if I even look at it from a literary history, Yeats lived in Hoth and wrote about the ghosts of Hoth, and then Joyce, where I met you last year, the rhododendron gardens, yeah. Hoth Castle and Varnes. You know, it's this history that is, as I say, literature has been my salvation, so Hoth is tied in with that, that those people that I felt fueled by walked these lands that we must protect. And we, the punters, are far less powerful than developers. And the best. And you think, as a writer, that it's been um, to have a very strong sense of being from a very particular place has given you, uh, I suppose, imaginative strength um, yes. to speak. Yes. Yes. Any. T I remember once. 
thinking I was going to emigrate and I didn't want to. Um, and realizing I'm walking around the hills, the West Mountain, going, this is who I am, this is who I am. And you know you're chanting something before you tune into what you're saying, and this is who I am, I'm this, you know. And I, I love it, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's partly the beauty, partly the historicity, is that the right word? Um, the sense of time, both past, future, um, that this thing has endured. And it, it, it's quite hard to describe this, this feeling I get, but it's also an anxiety because I'm fear for it. And I, I, I realise, like, I'm going around scared for hosts. It's a very hot thing to be scared for. I suppose if you feel you're part of the landscape yourself, then it's it's it is then a it's very it's an encroachment on yeah. yeah, on me. So then you went to uh, Trinity. So what about that? Uh, tell me a bit about the, your literary education and how, because you all you were you were um, inclined towards writing and reading yeah. from a very early age. Yes. And then I suppose the moment it became a professional was when you became a student of English and Trinity, is that right? Yeah, well, no, I'd, I would have left Trinity by then, but Trinity was the kind of opposite to the rest of my education. Trinity was the place to get to. Um, as I said, I got very alienated as a teenager by um, pretty much everything. <laughs> and, and I knew if I can get myself to do English in Trinity, I'll be on the right path I'm feeling good so it became a place for me to get to quite early on and it's like say Joyce was all UCD it, it was UCD sorry UCD but yeah he was under the tree was, just there yeah. there's a photograph of him under that tree yeah. yeah. yes but it, well Trinity was where I wanted I suppose they didn't let Catholics in but they did um, in my day it was also to do with Dublin, being in your city centre, but it, it's just, it was the opposite. And also I wanted to do English, and I'd been reared with all these dull cues, you know, and studying English was going to be just an extension of a dull cue. I knew that, you know, the, the Celtic Tiger hadn't, um, was another decade off. So it was, it was um, freedom, you know, to get in there and everything became about getting, I, get, I, I, I sound like I'm overstating it and I'm not, you know, I, I hated secondary school with a passion. I hate, I went to school oh. in Clontarf, I hated it. It was a convent, all girl, bitchy, you know, and maybe if there is no secondary school in Hoth, but Hoth is a very mixed society. There's, everybody is there. There's fishermen, there's um, wealthy people, there's a middle class, there's this old Protestant, um, crowd there was um, poverty because of the there's a, a lot of social housing still is um, so it was a very mixed society and then when I went to Clontarf it was blanket middle class and and just stifling you know because you know everyone's the same so I that I, I couldn't hack that at all leaving the kind of mix to go to this this um, especially girls Put a lot of any gender together is not great, you know. No. It's genders are better, just mixed. Mix them and match them is usually yeah. better. And so then Trinity was the, this liberation, mm -hmm. and um, quite a few of the writers that I talked to in this series have mentioned, well, those who went to Trinity, mm. that it was um, uh, a key pivotal, not just being students, but there's something about Trinity in that time mm. that was very important in their formation mm -hmm. as writers. Was that, is that the case yeah. for you too? Yeah, and it's hard to say. It was just the people were interesting. There's something cool about it, exciting, you know. I still always walk past Trinity when I come into town. I haven't seen Trinity, I hadn't seen it until today. And now they have wild wildflowers in the um, in front of Front Arch, you know, and it's great. I it just it's there, you know. When everything else changes, that facade yeah, is still, still there. there, and it, it's um, a touchstone. It's security. Like, imagine if you went to town and it was gone. Like, imagine how shocking that would be. So, yeah, it, it is. Um, I suppose when you have no path, and writers don't have a path, they have to invent the path as they go. If you can find foundations like Trinity, you put it there, you put your joys there, you put your poets in, you put all the stuff that makes sense, you have to kind of hoard it together, and now you've got that much path, and you go there and you find mm. some more, and you keep, you know, trying to construct a route for yourself. So, 
It is interesting to me that the way you just talk about Trinity there is quite similar to the way you were talking about Hoth earlier. Yeah. You know, um, something that should always be there. Yes. And I wonder if this, um, this question of change and anxiety about change yeah. or things going is um, that also along with the question of economic anxiety, is that, is that a shadow not cast over your work but that is present in your work, do you think? Certainly what I'm writing now, no. It's present in my life as a person. Um, no, um, I think we go through loss of self as we get older and that person I'm talking about with great excitement is gone and I know that and I'm writing about that and it's particularly stark if you become a mother, your guillotine comes down on your old life because now you're, you're just this person minding your baby. Yeah. So um, now I'm, the, what I'm working on now is about specifically the self you know and and i can look at it from that perspective that's the past trinity well hoth is, is is my present as well but um yeah i am anxious about all the change and it's funny like on the bus coming in i recently reread ulysses and love that sense of dublin you know and just coming in on the bus i hadn't been on the bus in ages because it's so <sighs> pandemic but you know just an old man was walking by and he saw the bus and he just went and then I'm gone and it's just like that's that's yeah. what this city is I'd hate that to go that specific Irish thing of but you remember we all thought during the Celtic Tiger that it was gone forever and then no. it, it has it has proved very yeah. resilient yes we communicate through gags yeah. through it's you know it's just it, 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 it is actually enduring um, so when I see little flashes of, you know, I'm going, it's all right, it's going to be, mind you, he was older. If I saw somebody 20 waving at him, <laughs> yeah, you might be worried. man driving a bus. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then after Trinity, you went into television. Um, yes, I did. Yeah, so just tell us the, the, the story of your, your career then until you became um, a published novelist. This was um, trying to invent the path, and uh, that's when, when I got out of college, it was 95, and the Celtic Tiger was beginning, like I, I was, we were reared to emigrate, you know, and I had, um, I had a green card to the States, I'd been to the States the year before, I'd worked in Germany for a while, then I got a green card to the States, and I was going to emigrate, again, not really wanting to, but um, it's, it's what I'd been reared to do and what I expected to do and what I was prepared to do. And then film industry started taking off here. It wasn't that I just wanted to work in film, it was just it started taking off. And I got onto a, a FOSS course um, and did a FOSS course in film and television skills or something. Um, and after being a runner all over in editing places, I got a job in Ballycus Angel, which was a BBC. TV drama about a priest, <laughs> a nice priest, and uh, worked in that for three and a half years while starting my novel, uh, starting all summer, because uh, TV is freelance. You work really, really, really hard for you know 22 weeks, and then you're unemployed and you don't know when your next job is. So in the unemployed, don't know when my next job is, that's when I started putting together the novel. And um, I wrote a first draft in 10 weeks, which just, you know, took me. The last novel I've written, it's not the one that will come out, I think it took six years to get a first draft. You know, so somehow, I think out of panic, I managed to block out a novel. And it was the first draft, like it, it largely remained similar enough. Um, and once I had that, um, then it was back, back to Trinity. Um, I've made a sense smoother than it was. I had a, it started going wrong for me in there, but my heart was not in it anyway. You know, I liked editing. I actually learned an awful lot from editing. Yeah. Specifically, be out. You, you move stuff around. You know, there's you get your shooting script and you shoot it and you stick it together, scene one to scene six. Sometimes I can see it in your writing because you're, you're very good at transitions among the oh, things you're good you. at. And I, I wondered, 
Um, did you hone that skill in Valley Kiss Angel? Oh, you, yeah. everything got moved around. That's the wrong opening, open, try that, no, try that, try, okay, move that. And, and it, it was that, like there was a picture of each scene, and you'd have 60, and, just, and I loved that. I thought that was really interesting. You know, and, and the plasticity of narrative was exciting to me. And of course, we had laptops, so, you know, we could do that if, <laughs> or typing, that would have been, you know, actually things would have been different, but if we hadn't computers when we worked, but we could, you can just cut, paste, move around. And um, that was um, exhilarating. You know, I, I used to love watching it come together, you know, and how things change if you put them in different places, even though they haven't changed, they just seem changed. It's so you brought those skills then to create writing in Trinity, and then you published four novels in relatively quick yes. succession. And that's yeah. And that's that's one arc of your yes. So we just talk about that before we move on to the later stuff, the jazz. Because um, one of the things that's come up again talking to the other writers the last while is that uh, the idea that writers born in and around the 1970s in Ireland that their work is to, makes more use of humour than say writers a generation older, a generation younger. And I was rereading your work the last few days. And it's definitely true in yours. There's a kind of um, uh, an ironic edge to it, where you never fully know um, what is what is serious and sincere, and what is kind of a gag. Um, that I think might be characteristic of the generation, that generation. Do you think that's true? I think that goes back to the bus thing. I think it's an Irishism. You know, I. That's the thing I'm scared of losing. Um, as I mentioned, um, just finished, not just finished a while ago, finished rereading Joyce. And that humor, that Irish, Joyce, it's, it's Dublin humor, but it's, it's, um, it's there. Like, a, you know, after the funeral, uh, Paddy Dignam, Paddy Dignam, his funeral, and Corny Kelleher, who's the funeral director, comes up and goes to the funeral attendees. That went off A1. What? Well, <laughs> the funeral director. Yeah. I don't think, I think, oh, please say that won't ever be lost. Yeah, I live opposite a primary school, and the other day the, I walked out of the house and the children were all screaming at me from behind the railings. At you? Yeah, and, okay. I, I, and I realised their, so their ball had gone over the railings right. and wanted me to go. So I ran over yeah. and retrieved it and yeah. threw it over. And there was like great shouts of adulation. It was, like, it was a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful way to start my day. Like 40s. And then I turned around the corner and this man, a bit like your man in the bus, uh, looking at the bus, he just walked with the cap and everything. He just looked at me without smiling yeah. or anything. He just said, here he comes, hero of the hour. <laughs> and I was like, and off he went. <laughs> I wasn't, I'm not sure, was he making fun of me? Was he like, did he, he see how proud I was? <laughs> or was he, Hey, it was, um, so it's, it's alive and well yeah. in, uh, in Dublin 8. Anyway. Yeah, well, I hope it's, like, how can that be lost? You know, how I can think that stuff has strong antibodies, you know? Yeah, I, think, I do. I think it'd be hard to get rid I of it. I think it's in the bloodline. But I wonder, is there also a particular kind of growing up in the 1970s and 80s brand of humour that is, is there? I'll tell you one to? thing that is different from us and older is we didn't have the internet. We didn't, we, we just had mono channels. Now my kid begs to be let watch YouTube and watch gamers on YouTube. And I've noticed his sense of humor is lifted from their gags. And you see, that's his pool. Whereas yeah, we just right. had, yeah. <laughs> it was about that size, <laughs> yeah. the pool of humor. Yeah. <laughs> but we were all in the same pool. A lot of hooks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we were all working from the same um, jokes and the same yeah. um, cultural references and this, the same way of being. So, That's true. you know, that, that will change it. That this kind of sense that there is a, a, some sort of common culture that you can refer to and it'll be funny because everybody will know what you're referring to. Is, you know, I mean, yes, yeah. plus yeah. Um, they're, they're, my kid's scope of reference is going to be completely different to mine. You know, we had Wanderly Wagon. What else? <laughs> what more do you need? <laughs> it was really <laughs> I got satisfied all it my desires. It was a really so. weird show. Like, I used to scream when the crow came on. But he has, and it's not Irish, is the other thing about his 
frame of reference, it's all, it's these, they seem to be mainly um, American. So I do remember when Friends came on. Do you remember when Friends started, people started um, uh, speaking with that accent? <laughs> <laughs> like us, <Yeah. laughs> by people, I mean, we, um, a lot of people my age started, you know, going like, like they're so funny. You know, so will he ever, will my kid ever have that, that uniformity? No. So I, does that mean we will lose the, you know, hero of the hour gag? You know, I don't know. They'll have different gags. I suppose, yeah, everybody has a tool, given a toolbox, and yeah. then you see what to do with it. But just because you mentioned America there, like it is, so you asked us to read um, this essay you wrote about, um, about motherhood um, yeah. for today. And I was actually, did I, uh, <laughs> or <laughs> I was teacher. told, <laughs> well, I did the homework. Okay. Um, and I'd read it before, so I read it again this morning, actually. Um, and I was thinking of asking about some of the bits that are at the edges of it rather than what's mm. at the center of it. And it opens with this sentence about America. Yes. And I was wondering what America, both as a place and as an idea, and even as a literary tradition, has meant to you. Because it comes up here and there in New yes. York and also in conversation with you. Yeah. I didn't know you'd done this thing in New York. But uh, there's, but Nabokov is a writer that you're often associated with. And I, I, see, the, I see the real similarities. Especially Again, a funny writer, writer, you know? Yeah. And who was really from somewhere that really was gone. Yeah. I mean, there was yes. there was no way. I mean, yes. that was yes. there was no yes. house castle I hadn't left. Of that. It was yeah. all, all of us. Yeah. Every trace of it. He's from a place that didn't exist anymore. Wow. Um, but I think of him also as an American writer, obviously. Yes. But so, what about America for you in American fiction? And um, I was just very struck by the fact that you opened this very personal, very intimate essay that's set in the Coombe and places like like very Dublin. You opened it with, um, well, it was written in. in it was in, written in there. Nova, but there was something about America and, and the imagination that seemed important. Well, to me well actually, it was that America had pulled me out of, out of motherhood, because mm. Ireland doesn't support motherhood. Therefore, it, it's all Ireland is a maternal society, meaning that the mother does everything, and there isn't the, um, there isn't supported childcare or any of that. You have to. Um, it's very, very expensive. It's more expensive in Ireland than the States. And then I got offered work in Villanova University and I took it and it was great. And it liberated me from my child. <laughs> it sounds terrible, he's a lovely kid, but it was, I found it extremely hard to be a full-time mother. And with a writer's income, you are a full-time mother. You know, Unless you've had some sort of commercial success, you're, you're not gonna be able to afford that those fees but then this job came and now I had an income I had a job and now I can pay for childcare so that was the first time I was able to put sentences together and they're all very short sentences because it was written in between his naps um, it's the quickest thing I've ever written it's the least edited thing I've ever written but it was the first glimpse of I'm get, gonna get out of this hole you know I felt very as I mentioned that guillotine that hurt you know, yeah. it, it actually physically hurts when you're cut off from your writing life, from your thinking life, from your 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 being, you know, it, it was very harsh. So um, I f was rescued by Villanova University who, who offered me this. Now, now I'm an income generating unit, which is really important, you know, because you as once <sighs> once you have once there's a baby, we're into unpaid labor and who does it? And I've become very aware of who's who's doing the unpaid labour, and it is a female endeavour. And we saw it again in COVID when you know the the child cares and the schools they all closed. So who was doing it again? It's 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 women. Um, so it was set in Villanova because. Thank you, Villanova. You know, thank you for um, for giving a new mo new mother. He was two. I was two years into motherhood, but this was the first um, escape from it. Um, and therefore the first time I could write, because I hadn't written anything for so long, because if you have this <laughs> going on, you, ca you cannot think, you know? It was, it was absolutely remarkable what motherhood did to my brain, and I tried to write it down there. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe for, if any of the bold listeners haven't done the homework, you might um, 
just summarize that that essay because it was an, an unusual foray into non-fiction for you so yeah so and maybe I, I, just to just run us through what the essay well the, the main thing that about motherhood was how unprepared i was for how you can no longer think if you have i feel like you're kind of sold a pup you're sold this image of and it is that too you know but it's a lot more this image of you and serenity and um you're going to have this smile and but actually your stress out of your head and all you can think of is that baby because it really kicks in the evolution you are minding this child to the exclusion everything else falls away but it means you can't think anymore and you can't certainly can't write i couldn't women have they really you know and i don't know how i remember i had to interview barbara king solver and she, you know, one of the things I read, she used to breastfeed while. <laughs> I just, wow. Uh, wow. What? Like, uh, I could barely. I could barely finish sentences. You know, I wouldn't have been able to have this conversation with you. So, you know, I want. I wanted to write about that. Um, Sorry to cut across there for a sec, but also there's a sense in the essay that this stuff has been kept secret, and there's a there's a feeling in the essay that there's a kind of a a sort of almost clandestine communication mm. amongst these new mothers, um, who are, especially one in particular in the group, yeah. who are kind of, yeah, like, sort of secretly enemies of the regime. And oh, are, it's and all, are, it, was, it was Hollis Street, uh, and it's shocking. In sorry, there. not the coom, it was Hollis it's Street. It's shocking sorry. in there. It's, I was like, what? You know, it's like, and it's like they do it on purpose. They wake you up, and you know, there's babies screaming the whole time. You're so you're like, I came out of there like hallucinated. I still ask my husband like. And he went, you weren't at your best. Because <laughs> I hadn't slept for, like, you, yeah. you, you, I, I knew I was crazy. I knew I'd kind of gone broken on through to the other side in there. And I, I've never broken through to the other side. It was, it was that kind of jittery. And then you have to take home this infant. And um, it was, it's tough. Like, it's, it's so hard. Um, yes, women will tell you between themselves just, all, all the ravages to their body, for instance, but there's a public face that we put out. Um, I kind of think of birth as like, if you're walking along a street and there's lots of people and you fall and you pick yourself up and you go, I'm fine. <laughs> you may have a broken leg. You, you're you're going to get out of there and then sort it out. You're, you're not going to go, okay, everyone make a fuss. I've, you know, broken my leg here. You just get up and you say, you're fine, you keep moving. And that's a real Irish mommy thing to do. It, it does, yeah, I, I <laughs> and there's a delicate line because if, if you really spell it out, is that the end of the human race? Because <laughs> who's going to go down? Like if I'd known everything I knew now, I think I said this in the essay, I wouldn't have had the baby. But then I wouldn't have had the baby. And now I have this child who is the best thing that's ever happened to me. So oh, I suppose now I've been writing about a novel about it. And, if I have a thesis, which I don't, it's a novel, but if I did, it would be that um, the genders need to work together on this one. You know, babies have fathers. Fathers need to um, be part of their lives. And the children need to understand. That's why the novel I'm writing is actually addressed to the child, um, what motherhood is, so that we all kind of go, okay, this is, this is what it is, and we need to um, support the mother as well, you know, not just go oh, evil lovely baby, good luck with that. Um, yeah, yeah, and then to be prepared to be the object of such intense need and... Yes, and, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great, but it, it does wreck your brain. It is great, like, I, I wouldn't change it at all, but um, I would have supported myself better, you know, I'd have put certain things in place to have a fuller understanding. And now, then I go, well, then I wouldn't have written this novel that I have. I'm hopefully we'll finish it in between the mothering. <laughs> yeah, in between. <laughs> the, I, cause I, the essay, I mean, it also, it's back to that, that theme of change and that it does, it, it does sort of narrate this terrifying kind of plunge into an abyss and a fear that that change is permanent. Yeah. And then, and you really bring the reader along in that sense. And then at the end of it, turns out that it's that it does end it does yes um, and there are, it turns into something new yeah but it's not in any very it's not in a kind of sentimental powder like it's 
it's, it's an ending that is hopeful or positive, but that doesn't erase the suffering that, that well, led up to it. It's, it's all, ca a lot of the motherhood stuff is couched in sentimental terminology. And it, it, it's very um, patronizing to the mother, I find, because I'm still an intelligent being, you know, and I'm, I'm still a creative being, even though for that period I was stupid. And it was really, really interesting to not, like I remember looking at a dark timetable <laughs> and kind of, I have to be there at this, I can't do that song, you know, it's, 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 it was really interesting to no longer be able to think because you're used to just your, everything yeah. being truncated and, you know, you forget everything and um, to, to make that huge life change um, was, it, as an artist, it's interesting, you know, looking back on it, I want to go, whoa, that was, uh, how do I depict that without it being really boring and whiny? Yeah. And that has been the challenge to depict it, to make a, a dramatic story out of it, which I hope I have. So something I was struck about in the essay is, uh, well, so it's obviously um, a very powerful feminist essay. It is trying, it is succeeding in bringing a kind of hi hidden experience that women have, making it public, bring it out into the light. And it does it in a, you know, all holds barred by powerful way. And the person, the figure that you reach for, um, for company, in in the essay is W. B. H. Yeah, I know, it's mad. So. How about that? Because he's he's well high. mother. He's, he's <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a very maternal figure yeah. of WBA. So you've because um, he's 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 come in for a drubbing um, recently. In How is he? Place. So um, how is he coming um, for a drubbing? Uh, yeah, here and there. Yeah. Um, okay. As I suppose. Yeah, I suppose you couldn't really say he was a, uh, a you know feminist or on it, but um, a maternal. <laughs> What, so tell us about that, and um, I, I found that a very interesting part of it. That it says we are, your we are in very interesting times with how the the males are being reevaluated. We are, you know, and you know, I'm sorry. That it's funny having reread Joyce. It's like he got it right every time, you know. And yes, he will find it. He is on the right side. And then, yes, I can see Yates. There are problems with women there. Why did I turn to Yeats? Because he's one of, remember the stones I was putting in place? And he is a great artist. And it's, I, I value that more than anything. And Yeats had writer's block. And I, th I think that's amazing. And then he came out of it with a poem about writer's block. And that was one, my touchstone there. You know, I, I lie down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. So um, if a great figure like him um, can lie down in, in the foul rag and bone shop, I didn't lie down, I fell down, but you know, I looked to him to help me. And they do help me, yeah. you know, like Yates helps me. Um, it's funny, I've been thinking about Yates and Joyce. Here I am, like years, why am I thinking about them? Because they're my touchstones, but I was thinking about, you know, Yates was his response to the pandemic and to, you know, jo Joyce is writing new essays about, you know, Corny Kelleher and all, all this, these um, little tiny humane interactions and sad things, funny things, man grieving loss of his child and marriage. and son grieving the loss of his mother but all the little stupid interactions they have whereas Yeats was writing at the same time you know things fall apart the falcon cannot hear the falconer and it's totally different ways of looking at the same thing yeah and I find that really interesting because the thing that joins them is their artists and it's, it's all about the imagination and you take this awful awful thing and you come up with this stuff look what you could you know and there's salvation so yeah I I suppose Yeats isn't going to be the great feminist. <laughs> Although it's what it suggests, you know, you're, is that that. Well, he helped me. Yeah. That, um, <laughs> when I was on my knees yeah. in the Fowler Or his poetry show. did. Like he, he, yeah. He, yeah he, he didn't come over and babysit, no, which would have did been not. very nope. helpful. <laughs> but, <laughs> Nor did Joyce. <laughs> no, to Joyce. No. <laughs> I don't think I. Well, that's what I was reading about Joyce is to be in the bed with the kids crawling over him, writing new essays. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how you do right. that. Uh, so maybe just uh, wrap up then by um, 
There's two things I wanted to ask you about before we finish. One is um, you're not on social media. That's not part of your no. work as a writer. No. And, um, Don't get it. I, like, I, I'm, I, I'm really glad I grew up after that. I'm really glad I grew up. I can't even understand how Twitter unfolds and how you follow sentences, but it, it's that um, also the, the kind of invasion of privacy. I, I couldn't bear it. So um, I, I don't want to hear other people's opinions of me. Um, I think that comes from going to a convent school where there's girls right. bitching about <laughs> each other. They're not going to hear anything good. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> primitive form of social media. <laughs> yeah. But like, thank God we weren't armed with phones then. Yeah, Can you, like, I, I actually have thought that, I'd say maybe 10 times I've gone, <gasps> thank God they didn't have phones. phones. In on top of yeah, that. yeah, then it's following yeah. you, you know, because it is, and that, that is a universal thing. I don't think that's a generational thing that girls will undermine each other in certain ways. Um, boys will thump each other. You know, I, I think, um, yeah, so no, I don't do social media and find it kind of frightening and creepy. So the last question is, do you want to tell us something, um, whatever you want, as much as little you want about the next book? Okay, um, yeah, it's a novel about motherhood about the early years before a child can really speak and it's about it, it's actually it's i mean it's about a lot of stuff but it's, it's about that severance of self um where you have to become by definition a totally new person and you lose who you are um it's about the existential boredom of being stuck with a little kid it's about the panics that happen um it's about the difficulties it inflicts on a marriage but it's about the love you know the incredible love as well more i mean i when i and it's it's really you mentioned humor i remember thinking when i started this book this book must not be funny because there's nothing funny about any of this um and in the beginning it's not funny but then it gets funny and then it gets okay and then we all find our way and we move on. And I, my, my um, little theory is just that people just sort of forget those early years because uh, babies erase themselves, you know, they, they get bigger and you forget the little one, then they're big and you forget that one and they keep kind of um, overriding their, their past. But you do forget those early years and they are really difficult. So I wanted to write about the stuff we usually forget. And that's what, what I have written about, I think. And it's fiction. It's not a yes. memoir, but it's, it's, yes. it's fiction. And it's okay. funny, when I wrote that essay in Winter Papers, um, it's the most read thing I've ever written. Really? And there was lots of people wanted me to write more. And this, I suppose, goes back into the social media thing, but it's not about me. It's about the imagination. You know, here's this set of circumstances. What can your imagination do with that you know I, I realize more than ever I believe in fiction I love fiction I think it's really interesting that you can just make stuff up you know you don't even know yeah. what you're going to make up till you make it up but I have faith in that that is a perfect place to end this and the series thank you so much Claire thank you Barry mm. thank mm. you